Well, looks like it's that time of the year again. A time to come up with a new definition for what a planet is. Or basically, there's a new proposition for how we should be defining planets and for why the current definition doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, discuss why even this definition is maybe not perfect either, and discuss where all of this goes. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's talk about planets. Or I guess let's talk about, so what is a planet? Or I guess more specifically, why isn't this a planet? Pluto. Why isn't Pluto a planet? Well, as you might know, back in 2006, IAU, or International Astronomical Union, decided to change their definition of planets for maybe one small reason. Because our telescopes were improving more and more, a lot of researchers started to discover a lot of additional objects that kind of resembled Pluto, both in size and in mass, and possibly even sharing similar orbits. And so because of the sudden influx of these new objects that would have to be also defined as planets, which I personally thought would be super cool by the way, some of the members of this astronomical union reasoned slightly differently. They thought that it might actually burden, I guess, students or people wanting to know about planets, because now they have to know so many all at once. I mean, doesn't really make sense, but okay, let's go with that. And so during this time, they redefined a planet as something that has to have three specific properties. First of all, it has to orbit the sun. Okay, cool, I guess. Uh, next. Second of all, it has to be massive enough to assume a spherical shape through what's known as hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, as you can see in this image, some of these objects are not entirely round, mostly because they're actually spinning really fast, but an object that's not massive enough, such as, for example, Vesta, does not contain enough mass to assume a spherical shape. And so that would actually disqualify Vesta right away. But so far, it would not disqualify these objects, and more intriguingly, it would not disqualify Vesta's neighbor, Ceres. Ceres is just a little bit more massive, but more importantly, it contains a lot more water and a lot of other ices, which makes it much easier for Ceres to assume a spherical shape. If you made out of water, as opposed to a rock, it's just a little bit easier to become a sphere. But then there's that third property, and that's what made Pluto not a planet. To be a planet, the object has to have cleared its orbit, remaining the dominant object in the orbital path. And though I guess I understand what they mean, it's kind of vague and a lot of scientists actually had a problem with this definition. What exactly do they mean by clearing the orbit? Or I guess more specifically, which orbit? For example, in some of the previous videos, we've discussed the discovery of an exoplanet that actually shared its orbit with another object that was also an exoplanet. So by that definition, neither one of those objects is a planet even though they actually are really massive and have all of the other properties. So in that sense, objects sharing orbits would be basically disqualified right away. But one of the biggest issues that the scientists behind this recent paper had was really in the wording of the definition. For example, a planet has to orbit the sun. So by that definition, literally none of the other objects we've discovered so far outside of the solar system are planets. And so in this recent paper, we get additional reasoning and additional definition that tries to quantify things just a little bit more and to some extent make it just a little bit more scientific. And they're also going to be making this proposition to the International Astronomical Union sometimes in August of 2024. And so let's discuss what they propose and why their definition makes a little bit more sense. So first of all, in their definition, the object has to orbit one or more stars or even brown dwarfs and stellar remnants. So this actually includes neutron stars, this includes white dwarfs, and of course black holes. And that's of course important because we have discovered planets around most of these. Then they discuss the mass. According to their definition, the object has to be massive than 10 to the power of 23 kilograms, which you can actually see as a kind of an imaginary boundary between a lot of dwarf planets and actual planets in the solar system. And at this mass, we are pretty certain that anything can become spherical and resemble a typical planet. And even if this planet is squished because it's spinning too fast, as long as it has enough mass, it should be considered to be a planet. Now this obviously makes a lot more sense than just saying the object has to be spherical, but I guess not everyone might agree with that particular value for the mass. Personally though, I think it works. But then there is the upper limit as well. And here this is where my problem starts. They state it as 13 masses of Jupiter. And this is essentially in regards to brown dwarfs, because at this point we believe that a lot of objects do become brown dwarfs and are no longer planets. 
and brown dwarfs generally behave differently and contain a lot of properties planets do not. But 13 masses of Jupiter is maybe a somewhat outdated range. Because as you might have learned from some of the previous videos, which might be in the description below, scientists have actually discovered quite a lot of brown dwarfs, actual brown dwarfs, with much smaller masses. Even down to like 6 masses of Jupiter. And so here to become a brown dwarf, it might not be just the mass, it might also be some additional properties, such as maybe composition, that we don't actually understand. And so maybe a better definition would be, if an object starts having some kind of a fusion, such as deuterium fusion, then it's no longer a planet, it is a brown dwarf. So in that case, mass actually doesn't work. And the other main reason why mass makes more sense than just calling an object a sphere, is because for a lot of exoplanets, we cannot actually see their shape. They're so far away from us that determining if they're spherical or not would be practically impossible to determine if they're planets. And so here by having mass, which is a measurable quantity for exoplanets, is way more convenient than having the definition as a round object. Although interestingly, in the solar system so far, all objects over 10 to the power of 21 kilograms, or basically about 100 times less massive than what they propose, all appear to be round. And so having that limit at 10 to the power of 23 could be seen as maybe a little bit too much. And then of course there's that question of orbits, or basically clearing orbits. And here they refer to this as dynamical dominance. And so if any object has enough gravity to clear a path by absorbing or ejecting smaller objects, it's believed to be dynamically dominant. But for the definition of dynamical dominance, they do actually come up with a formula and a specific value for how all of this could be defined. Now you can actually see the formula right here, but in essence this works for all of the planets in the solar system and does not work for any of the objects such as Pluto. It kind of connects to the concept known as the Hill Sphere. A gravitational sphere of influence of any object that usually becomes larger and larger as the object acquires more mass. And officially it's defined as the region around a planetary body where its own gravity, compared to gravity of, for example, the Sun, is the dominant force in attracting satellites. And so here the Hill Sphere can be used as one of the potential values in order to find out if the object has dynamical dominance. But naturally it's not perfect. For example, when it comes to eccentric orbits, things become more complicated. Likewise, the additional perturbations from other planets, or even the interactions with the gas disk around the star, would actually make a lot of this formula not work anymore. And though for the solar system it doesn't matter as much, it would matter in a lot of other systems, such as for example the Trappist-1, where the planets are very close to each other and where they do affect each other at all times. And so that last property, the dynamical dominance, is still kind of difficult to define. But their attempt is still the best we have so far, especially because they have a very important side note. Here it refers to the ability of the planet to clear a zone and not the state of having cleared the zone. Or just to rephrase this, sometimes something might temporarily share the orbit with a planet for maybe a million years or even longer, but will then actually become cleared or disappear for other reasons. And so in that sense, we cannot just disqualify something from being a planet just because someone temporarily shared its orbit. And the formula provided in this study are actually pretty good. And so honestly, so far, this is definitely one of the better definitions, but it still ignores one important factor. It ignores the idea behind planets being geological objects. In many cases, geology, and not really orbits around stars and so on, define planets as planets as opposed to anything else. And we've discussed this concept in one of the previous videos that did present a slightly better definition of planets, at least in my opinion, something like two or three years ago. You can find that video in the description. But anyway, on that note, well, it's still exciting that the scientists are still talking about this, because right now the definition of our planets is honestly not very good. And hopefully, in the next few years, it will become better. And so once there is some kind of a conclusion on this, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.